Hyde Park community that we are providing reasonable access to the technology. So the solution then, go to the next one, was to jump to what the library had done. And the library had put in some style and turnstiles. <laughs> Not that style and turnstile, but almost. but almost like it, except it was a, it was silver. Um, and we looked at that and said, okay, that particular library didn't have that kind of access control at the front. We needed to put some kind of access control in there because then somebody would have to show an ID to get into the space. So to stop the pizza, we needed to put in a turnstile. So go to the next slide. The problem was we had one entrance point into the space. And so if you have the turnstile, you, can't, you, you want to control your access. Right? You can't have people ac exiting the same way easily because, frankly, what will happen is the students will do like what some people do at um, subway turnstiles, slide a little bit forward, slip through, come on in, and you haven't solved the pizza problem. The second thing we still had going on is that the people at the service desk, if somebody got stuck there, and all of you that are involved with libraries know this, if somebody has their ID and it doesn't work, you can't be going, hey, person in the next room way over there, I can't get in, because all of these people will kill you. So we had to do something about that. The last thing was is that we had to provide an accessible entrance into this space. If we put a turnstile right here, there's no way to get a wheelchair into the space. So one thing led to another. And so the pizza and the turnstile, and we started thinking about this, and we started looking at the way the Chicago subway system works. And then studied what the library was doing and came up with a plan. So go into the next slide. And then the plan was, was to move the air conditioner, which turned out to be not that difficult, change the entrance pathway so that you could come in through the turnstile. But then we had just a simple door that didn't have a handle on it on this side that you could exit through. And if somebody came in with a wheelchair, a person could assist them at the time it was still legal to do that. A person could assist them and open the door and bring them in that way. Plus, as it turns out, this door is the fire exit for this entire end of the building. So you could go running and screaming through here all the way out into the library. But the other thing was we had to move the service desk. And so I said, OK, if we're going to move the service desk, one of the problems of the service desk is the person there could only see that spot. If we're going to move that, we want to make sure that that person can see as much as they can in the entire space. In order to do that, we need to move the wall. As it turns out, that wall was a cheap wall that was installed about 10 years earlier. And when we moved it back, it turns out it was entirely filled with serial cables from green screen terminals which was a bit of an archaeological discovery. <laughs> and somebody's phone line, right there. Um, <laughs> that was fixed. Um, the other thing that came up, and we said, we need to get staff into this space. We need to think differently about that. Because as it turns out, the students who were working the service desk before, even if the pizza was in there, didn't feel empowered to tell somebody to not do something. They, they, could, they were there to assist people with problems, but not necessarily police the space. And if somebody got into an argument, there was no one there to back them up. And so by putting staff into the space, that gave the students a bit of confidence to be able to confront folks that would necessarily be, shouldn't be there doing something else, because if something got a little bit out of control, there was a full-time staff member that could help them. So we said that, OK, if we're going to do that, if we're going to move an air conditioner and put in a turnstile to deal with the pizza, and in order to deal with the sight line and move the desk, we've got to open up the wall. Then we will deal with the other problem. And the other problem was power, the bane of our existence. We still haven't figured out how to do long-term wireless power. We're still getting you know, better at that in terms of battery life. And maybe one day hydrogen fuel cells in our laptops will solve the world's problems. But until then, we still have to plug into the wall. The other thing was is wireless wasn't around at that point, so we had to have physical connections. The disturbing thing that was in this space before, in the church pew configuration, is that we had put raceway, that, that classic metal raceway, we all know what it looks like, uh, laid it on the floor at some point in its history and had the jacks pointing up. Okay, So the outlets, power outlets are up. So we had these little strips on the floor with power outlets up. The second thing we had is when we networked it, we didn't really have a network closet, which eventually ended up right here. We didn't have a network closet. So what we ended up doing was, at the end of every table of those church pews, we ended up putting network hubs bolted to the bottom of the tables. What we discovered when we started tearing down the space is that students that were chewing gum <laughs> had decided that they didn't want to stick at the bottom of the table because they'd bump into it. But if they pulled this little cover off the network hub, they could shove it into the network hub. <laughs> we literally took apart one of the, hu one of the hubs and 
it was amazing it was still working because it's entirely full of gum. <laughs> Um, insulating the hub. Says something about that technology at the time and the reliability of that technology. So we have to do something about that as well. And if we're going to do that and we're going to have to deal with the powers, it turns out when we opened up the covers of those outlet trays on the floor, um, there were literally, you could, see, you could see liquid levels of where soda was poured into them. So the students could have been electrocuted at some point from a Coca-Cola disaster. <laughs> And say, okay, this is all bad. We just got to, we just got to do something different. <laughs> all because of a pizza coming through the door with the turnstile. He said, all right, if we're going to do that, first we're going to take advantage of every column we have, and every wall we have, and put power and data there. This was a wild concept in 1998 to put an outlet and a data jack in the same place. <gasps> Why would you want to do that? That took well weeks of discussion to finally convince folks that those two things go together. That then changed the way our facilities group started thinking about power and data in buildings. They don't always get it right, but they get it better than, than they have in the past. So that was the first thing that came out of this. The second thing was, is if we do this, we want to break up the church pew computing thing because, frankly, we found that our students were working in different ways. People were not coming in and sitting in rows and rows of machines. In fact, they were pulling chairs over and trying to rearrange the furniture, but they couldn't because it was anchored down with the liquid stuff underneath and you couldn't do much of anything else. So we said, all right, let's create these different types of pod configurations and give it a shot. See what happens if we put five students in a space and what they do with the space from that point. And if we provide enough power and data around the perimeter, then we could reconfigure that. If it doesn't work, we'll just do something else. We're not going to go to this put jacks on the floor thing that we had before. So give ourselves some maximum flexibility. So we did that. Go to the next slide. When, in the process then is when we figured out the sight line issue from the staff because one of the things we ran into is people were coming in and out of this door into this other person's office. We wanted to tackle that. We wanted to make people could see everything. And from a safety aspect, since this place is open late at night, we wanted to make sure that as staff were here and student were here, you would feel safe working in this environment. In the previous environment where the service desk was off in the corner and nobody could see anything, the students were terrified. And the facility was open until 3 in the morning in one of the creepiest corners of campus. And the way to get into that space was coming up a dark, poorly lit, barely alarmed fire stair, which we ended up closing after that. Because one of the concerns was we want somebody to feel safe, not only to use the technology, but to feel comfortable in here that when they're working with the technology and working with their friends, this is a place that you can have free-flowing ideas, not be limited by, you know, I can only do this here, or I'm worried about somebody coming in the shoulder, or a pizza showing up next to me. Next slide. A little blown out, but this is roughly what we ended up doing. We ended up bringing power and data down, took advantage of the ceilings, created these pods. These pods are all based on the classic three-foot terminal table. A lot of people today don't know what a three-foot terminal table is, but we all have them. Three feet wide, 30 inches deep, indestructible, never can get rid of them. Um, but we also sat down and designed our own tables, these half-moon tables here. So you could put them at the end of those areas. And if you didn't want to use them as a half moon table, you could take two of them and put them together. And now you have a small seminar table and reconfigure it to something else. But the idea of this was that I could get two or three people. You could see a student right here, around there. The other thing it eliminated was the corner problem. Turn the corner really fast, get clipped by a table. Made it a safer environment to work in. Next slide. At the same time, we were planning the computing facility, which just recently closed downstairs. We took a lot of those ideas and said, okay, if we have those concepts we we're talking about, the small group kind of ideas, students, multiple students working together around a single screen, sort of different types of ways of thinking, what could we do? How could we think about that space and apply those ideas that we had just explored in this other place at a relatively low cost? In the end, I look back on it and I can't believe the fact that we actually had no budget to do that, tear down those walls and do those things, but as it turns out, it was a Tearing down is cheap. Doing carpet tile, as long as you don't have asbestos underneath the floor, which we didn't, um, is cheap. Paint is cheap. And the power and electrical upgrade we had to do anyway because we had exceeded the capacity of the space. And the network folks were so embarrassed with what was there, and since I'm in an IT organization, we fixed the network quite quickly. Um, and so we ended up doing that as a really affordable thing and then applying the concepts to this particular project. So if you go to the next slide. We applied what we had learned in, in designing that other space, that we needed to think about this environment like we thought about the subway station. Because at the time, again, we didn't have logins. We needed to think about access control. And one of the things about this space is unlike the other building, 
This is outside the security perimeter of this library. We simply could not depend on the folks at the front desk at Curar to control the access to the space. In the past, we did have that control, but as we renovated the space and thought about it differently, we needed to do something different in here as well. So we adopted the same sort of plan and models and workflows, but we, one of the things we noticed is that not everybody wants to come in through an access controlled space to get work done. We needed to think a little bit differently about how computing worked. It wasn't just simply about us protecting hardware. It was really thinking about what people wanted to do. And the last thing we want to think about is the technology, which drove our architects crazy. Because we'd sit there and we would design these things. We're coming up with all these ideas and just you know, sort of white spot, white spot, white spot. And they'd say, what are you going to put there for a computer? I don't know. No idea. Because it's going to change three times before this thing's done. And considering this was never supposed to be built, by the way, um, this, is, this is purely a concept in which we could take different concepts, classrooms, seminar areas, group collaboration, this booth concept, a media wall, a cafe area, and literally take these different concepts and drop them in other places on campus. Um, yeah, we, we said it's, it, it, the technology is irrelevant. What it is is the interaction and how people are going to be working and observing our students. So go to the next slide. And you can see that this is after we opened up the facility, again, contrast problems, full of machines some conscious decisions that we made. First, again, we weren't looking at specific technologies except for one decision. And that one decision in 2000 was that all of the displays in this space will be flat panel. We were in the middle of that transition. It was a huge technology cost for us to undertake because at the time, LCD monitors were not cheap. Okay, a 13-inch, maybe a 14-inch LCD monitor was going for $1,300 a seat, and we had 86 seats. Okay? We cut a few deals. So that's one thing there. The second thing was is that we said, okay, one size doesn't fit all. The temptation for us was to go in and say, okay, church pew computing, put that back in, or lots of little pods, which is what we did in the other space. So you know, folks interact in different ways, especially in this library. One of the things we sat down with in the planning of this project was to work with the library staff quite closely, where we began to understand the difference between a user, which is our perspective, and a patron. And we introduced some of the concepts of what it means to have a patron in a computing space. It means respecting that individual in a very different way. We don't, you know, people aren't just coming in to use our technology. We're there helping them conduct their business and in service to what they want to do. And as a result, we need to create different environments for that. So in some cases, and you can kind of see it around the column here, but there's actually another space up here. There's actually three-quarter round circles of machines, or six machines are in there and in, in configured in the circular configuration. What we found is that business school students really liked coming in and using that particular space because they could all be working on a particular simulation and then somebody would stand up in the center of that circle and start talking to the other five students and they would have a discussion. It would be like a mini presentation. So if they were doing a case study project or something like that, suddenly they had a little case room in the middle of a public computing lab. The next thing we had, which you can a little bit see in here, we have these, again, these quarter round tables, and which are over here now, they've been relocated up here. We have two people on one side and two people on the other side, and it's sort of an S configuration. That allowed students to be working on two entirely different projects, but if they're friends, they could be talking to one another and having eye contact with one another in a very different way than sort of sitting back to back with someone. This is all done with the exact same furniture. We just simply laid out the machines in a different way. Along this wall, which you can sort of see the checked person out there, we had our media wall where we said, okay, what is the big thing that's been driving everybody crazy in working with media? Well, they bring in all these other materials and they need video decks and they need all this sort of stuff. And what do we give them today? Three foot terminal tables. That's not big enough to do anything. In fact, you want to deal with larger monitors. You want to deal with more stuff. And generally, you have two or three people working on that project together. It's not somebody working alone. Stretch that out. And so over a, a length of 40 feet, only had eight workstations on 40 feet. So every workstation had five linear feet to itself. So you could spread out, you could work, you didn't feel cramped. You had your own lighting control, you had task lighting in that area. There's some people that just do like sitting in the church pew configuration with a little barrier so that you know, don't push my stuff to the other side, that kind of thing. We created those kinds of spaces and you can see a little bit up here. The other thing I think that's important, if you go back one slide, Notice we have two service desks. Okay, this is also something that we learned by working with the library. 
And we learned that at some level you have a service desk which ends up being more of an access control point and an information point, but then you have specialized services. And we separated those functions. So we said this is essentially our general support desk. If you have problems with the computer and you have problems with the technology, because at the time people still were learning how to use a lot of the technologies, this is the place you go because it's the first people you'll see, it's the people you're familiar with. But if you have a specialized need, like learning how to do video editing, or how to use SPSS, or MATLAB, or Mathematica, that desk back there is for that specialized support. It's like going to the bibliographer. And so we ended up creating that particular environment, which ended up turning out to be a place that graduate students would come down and have TA sessions at. They would start having office hours right there. And because they were having office hours there, and this had lots of students from lots of other curricular programs, they'd say, okay, I'm here for this stats class. And suddenly people not in that stats class were going there saying, How, can I get help with my stats homework? And they were happy to help. The other thing that happened, and in this particular space down here, this is the conceptual drawing. It ended up being slightly different when we built it. So you had these teaching spaces down here. And go ahead, two slides. Actually, go ahead, one more. Hard to see. I uh, apologize for that. But that's the seminar area. You see the two screens. You can see the instructor there in shadow and the two tables of the machines. We created this teaching space that provided sort of a Windows side and a Mac side, and faculty started using it in very interesting ways. This is actually a final project presentation for an African studies class that came in and said they, they allowed their students to do any kind of media work. And so it gave the ability for somebody to do a video presentation, a slide presentation, put two things side by side, to actually interact with some software. They may have developed a website or something like that, all at the same time as part of this exam, inside of a public computing lab without any doors. Okay? We designed it, and it turned out a little bit by accident, but the space inside of, inside of here where the seminar area is turns out is able to really, really, really isolate sound. It's a concave space. The back wall is glass and concave. So as you're teaching, you don't need to use this. You don't need to amplify. The sound naturally bounces off the glass. It's something we said, OK, as we think about additional spaces, how do we do that? How do we take that idea somewhere else? When I think about the way the seminar is working here, how can we take that to our other classroom designs in ways that we don't have to deal so much with heavy acoustical adjustments and other things, can we design and work with architects to design the spaces in a way that will keep the sound in and, and, and isolate without going to ridiculous extremes. So go to the next slide. That particular work, then 10 years later, actually eight years later, started coming up and changing the way we think about our classrooms on campus. I mean, it seems very minor, right? You think a U-shaped classroom with a little table in the middle. It was the faculty that worked in that learning space that said, OK, I want to have that kind of experience where I can actually get to my students. The, the standard square arrangement of a seminar table is just not right anymore. I want to have a place where I can interact with those language students in a particular way, in a very personal way that I experienced in that computing space. And at some point in the future with wireless and laptops, if I want to bring that in, I still have a personal connection. It influenced now the way we're thinking about all of our classroom design on campus. Next slide. One of the characteristics of the space downstairs, and you can kind of see the curved wall I was talking about here in the seminar area, are the booths. These egg-shaped tables are signature elements. Um, if you see a booth in a library someplace, it more than likely was inspired from this one. The inspiration for this came from a restaurant that I was at downtown. I was sitting there at this particular restaurant. Actually, it's Bandera above the City Bank on Michigan Avenue. And I was sitting there with, with my partner, and she, was, she and I were talking. I said, what, you know, we're seeing this booth. And I said, what would it be like if we put a monitor right there? to illustrate what we're talking about. I said, well, that'd be really cool. I would love to have office hours, you know, have sit there with one student to work through an exercise in that particular way. I said, okay. Took it to our architects, designed this. Now, one of the things is you see here, single person working in these spaces, but it's really designed for two or three people to be working at any given time. And that it turns out in people working on projects, especially during midterms and finals, you'd find people handing off the project They'd be in the booth, and then two people would be there. One person would go to class, and the next person would come in, and they keep handing off that booth for the entire day. The record, by the way, of number of people in that booth, seven. <laughs> Don't ask me how, but I counted, and there were seven people in one of these booths. Little things make a difference. One of the things that one of my staff said is, this is going to be all wonderful, but if somebody goes out of this space and slides out of here, they're going to knock the monitor off. And at the time, of course, $1,300 monitors, we don't want to be doing that. 
So he said, okay, let's mount these things to an ARM system. Today we take that for granted. 11 years ago, that was a radical idea. Mounting a monitor or something, why would you want to do that? Those padlocks and cables will do a fabulous job. <laughs> Go to the next slide. What we ended up doing is taking that concept now in the Language Center and building something bigger. It's called the Learning Pod. It's for six to eight people, glass doors that open and close, round table there, monitor inside. That's actually a compromise. It turns out when we designed the space, we had problems getting the technology installed in the space. So for the time being, we put the monitor up there, and it turns out everybody loved the monitor there, not where we had originally put it, which was going to be over like right about here. And it turns out the walls were covered with whiteboard wallpaper. So now the entire writing surface that's white is all writable. You have the monitor taking the space over somebody's shoulder, and everybody said, well, that's ergonomically a nightmare. But notice what the students are doing. They just slid around. They moved around the clock. And they came to the other side and brought in very, very small light chairs, slighter than these, that they bring in. They watch the movie. Then they slide back and they go use the whiteboard. And you have this whole dialogue and interaction going in there. And it turns out faculty now are checking these things out and using this for their individual tutorial sessions. And we actually have small seminar classes being taught in those little pods, all coming out of the concept of the booth. Next slide. Kiosks. Oh, the bane of our existence, right? <laughs> Got to have them. As much as you like wireless, and it's supposedly will solve all of our problems, there's always that person either A, can't get their iPhone to work or their Blackberry or something like that to access your system, or B, doesn't want to be carrying a laptop, or C, just simply likes to be able to walk up and do something. Well, in 2000, this is the first of that kiosk technology. Thin client technology developed by Sun Microsystems. Another thing that our architects thought we were crazy for, because we were actually in construction building out this space, and they kept asking, four months before we opened it, what are you going to put there? I don't know. Keep building it. It hasn't been invented yet. That's a pretty tall order and a bit of uh, uh, chutzpah on my part to, to say that. But as it turns out, Sun released the technology. So the Sunray technology is a thin client technology. It's a you know, classic buzzword kind of thing. But what we did is we said what's important is the keyboard and the access to the information, not the computer itself. That's unimportant. That's a different kind of paradigm. We don't need to manage that. We don't need to control that. That can be a walk-up, log-in kind of thing. The computers behind this thing are literally built into the walls. They're phys you physically cannot get to these machines, um, which does create an interesting problem if somebody happens to drop the mouse down the hole where the thing, because then you've got to open up the wall to get the mouse out. But uh, minor things. You'll learn, you'll learn about that later. Um, the thing is, is that we looked at this and said that's a different kind of computing. It's a task-oriented computing, not one where we're saying I have to provide a full-blown computer. And it thought, you know, a lot of people thought it was crazy for putting in these kinds of just basically a web browser. That's all the thing displayed until this year. So for nine years, you got a terminal session or a web browser. That's it on an old version of Solaris, Fire, an ancient version of Firefox. It turns out the traffic on 50 of these workstations located around campus generated more traffic than all of our public computing labs combined. We had 300,000 visitors using those workstations in one year. Why? Because it's run and gun computing. Average time, three minutes. Come in, log in, check. Somebody there. Now today it's even worse because it's log in, run in, log in, check my learning management system, take a look at Facebook, do a quick IM, and I'm gone. We've now located these things all across campus, and we thought about it and said, you know what? We need to think different about that computing technology. Because the one thing that this has that desktop computers don't have, that we've learned in this space that we can apply in other places, is that I don't have to worry about something breaking here at the end. All of my management and my technology is back at a data center across campus. And so the computers that you see up here, the non-Mac computers along the window over there, are actually the evolution of these thin clients, and they're all basically connected to the network and running from machine room. It's just like the old green screen terminal days, but up to date. But it's running full Windows environments. And it's started to think now differently about how technology intersects with the space. We said, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't be thinking about designing space anymore from a technology organization, but thinking about how we augment programs. Other programs have different ideas of how to reach different communities. How can we help those programs take that to the next level and have the technology interface with the space in new and creative ways? 
So in a sense, that is the position that we're at today. And the challenge we have, of course, and this is, I think, the interesting thing, is that email station and that particular location was the first location on campus for wireless networking. And the thing was that we were trying to recreate because laptops weren't available at the time in that kiosk, these sort of laptop kind of environment. Well, today we have the laptops and the students are all around with that. We have students working wherever they want to work. How do we get the applications and technology to where they are working? In some cases, you need to have an environment that supports them, but it's not about the technology. It's about what they want to do. And so how do we do that? So this is where we're looking at virtualization technologies, where it can make it really easy to get a particular application associated with a particular class to that desktop. But that's working in partnership with the faculty, with the library, and trying to understand what it is that we're trying to do, getting back to that difference between a user and a patron. And for us, that whole thing, that we're, you know, we're, we're there to assist and help and advance the learning and discovery on this campus. So what's the best way to do that? Not to be separate, but to be like everyone else. So go to the next slide. So what's next? This is actually a conceptual drawing, never been shown before, um, of a potential space that I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the important thing about this is, is these concepts that we originally had worked on have led to a continual evolution on this campus in terms of thinking about how technology, space, and people come together. This is actually going to be a digital media facility, an AV services office, a space for media technology support, group collaboration, and an access control, the old turnstile back, to another environment, which is a huge faculty-oriented learning space. The thing here, and if you look at this and you compare this to the church pew computing of 11 years ago, there's not a lot of computers in here. Okay, this is a digital media space. We need to have high performance machines with dual monitors and networking and all those sorts of things. But what we're trying to do, and it actually was a, a meeting I was at with Shirley a, a, a couple of years ago, that we learned um, at this meeting. The important part is to ultimately respect the student and respect the faculty member and respect the patron or user. And that is something that we on technology side often forget. We respect the technology. But if you respect the user, you begin to create environments in which the user wants to work in, the patron wants to work in, I want to work in. And if there's anything that we've learned along the way is in all of these small evolutions, this little bit here and applying it there and taking this piece of furniture and adjusting it here, not thinking about something absolutely dedicated, but to thinking about something as incredibly flexible as, I mean, you don't see, you don't really experience it in terms of this particular room, but this is one of those rooms where those experiments are going on. And next year, this room will be very different. That we're making these little incremental choices, as Shirley pointed out, that lead to a larger programmatic change. Things that you don't realize. This is a 16 foot by 9 foot screen largest screen we have currently on campus. It's not in a major lecture hall. Okay, it's, so it's 16 by 9 aspect ratio, literally. It's also stereo. So we can do 3D movies in here. Okay, we made a choice in terms of the fabric material. It's actually meant for stereo visualization, for scientific visualization, but it wasn't stereo enough. And so that's what all the tape is on the floor here is for a virtual anatomy class. Put on 3D glasses and you'll be able to see the inside of a heart in three-dimensional space in this space. We're in the process and what will end up happening in, uh, this summer is we will be installing then a 16 by 9 projector in here, which will be a prototype projector for the entire campus. We want to see what it's going to look like and we'll partner with the library to try that here. We'll be installing stereoscopic projectors in this room that will actually be firing to a stereo screen over here. So that not only can that virtual anatomy class use this capability, but we're beginning to explore options of taking elements out of special collections and digitizing stereoscopic images of, let's say, a World's Fair. Just happened to be one here in the 30s. And putting that up so that you can experience potentially in a large screen environment what it was like to be at the World's Fair in the 1930s and use that high-end technology in the space. It's nothing more than a couple projection screens and some projectors and thinking about creatively of how you reconfigure and rethink that particular space. So it's lots of incremental things that ultimately lead to visions like this. <coughs> but if you decompose this, you find out I've got a service point. I've got space for people to work. I'm thinking about traffic patterns. And even if we only get this part done, we have a plan to keep moving forward and keep layering more and more onto this to create the environment that respects the individuals, that focuses on what people want to do, and ends up delivering, I think, a new level of service on a campus that, frankly, you know, church pew barn computing doesn't do. So with that, thank you. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, go to the next slide. One more. 
There's my email and the pizza. <laughs> uh, questions for Chad? Comments? Uh, quick question about the, um, the, the space before the last one you talked about. Uh, were those um, uh, pods, those desks, and uh, things, were they movable? Or were they, they you want to go back one slide? So in this particular space, we were not looking at those as being movable, uh -huh. partially because of the infrastructure we need to bring in. One of the things is we cannot, we cannot go below the floor. Uh -huh. So what we're doing is taking a look at, and what we're going to see, um, we're not that far along yet in terms of how this might work, we're going to see there are existing furniture systems out there that will do this. And if we can do that with the existing system to reduce the cost of the project, we will. Um, but the other piece of this is also trying to figure, think about the security because we're, our goal here is actually put much more advanced computing into this space than we normally would put into any other public space. And so we want to make sure, since this is open to the public, those doors up there would allow anybody to move in and out of the space. We need to think about locking that down. This is actually, it turns out, is a model and an experiment for a building that we're going to be building in two year, two three years. Um, and that's, I think, the other thing that, that plays into a lot of our planning. This feeds into the next building where this built upon another one and built upon it. Every, every space we work on and work in partnership with a group is a learning experience. And we experiment with something new and try that and, and take the good parts of that and throw other things away. And in this particular case, we just know from our patterns of users and how people use this technology that we're very confident that this could be built in for this particular environment. Whereas in other cases, that would not necessarily be the case. So as you think about the cloud computing aspects of this and what, where we are, we are in the middle of a transition stage of that. The technology choices behind the scenes that we're working with right now are absolutely cloud-based. We are, we are in the process right now of decoupling the whole idea of thin client hardware from the applications. What we want to do, ultimately, is get the operating system out of the equation. The operating system is just irrelevant. What you want to do is you want to get to the application level. And so what we're, the, the work that we're working on is saying, you know, if I need to use as part of a stats class, MATLAB, let's say, or SPSS. So I want to use SPSS as part of a stats class. What I want to do is be able to embed that application into my learning management system. So if I'm at home, I can use that application. But at the same point, if I'm working with a group or I need to work with big data sets, then maybe I want to use a different kind of environment. Or in the context, you were talking about the idea labs, at the, the idea spaces at the CBC, you know, that kind of thing. I may want to have an environment like this where I want to work with some folks, and so we want to decouple that hardware. So it's not a, not, a, not a question of whether or not the hardware is there. It's based on the context of how you want to use that tool, that we've got technology, the right technology in the right spaces. And that was a, that's actually been a shift in the last um, three to four weeks in terms of the thinking process of this, where we're looking now, instead of thinking about us providing labs and providing a learning management system thing, we're actually looking at providing platforms. And one platform is our virtual learning platform. And inside of that platform is our learning management system, our virtualization plant for applications and other things. Another platform is our physical learning environment. And so that has a particular sets of requirements associated with that. At any given time, those will intersect. Those two platforms will intersect. And that's been a huge paradigm shift for us because then we can start thinking coherently about what it means to provide services to students in the virtual space and then what it means to consume them in the physical space and have two different teams thinking about that and not being bogged down by one issue or another. And that's, that's the big shift we've seen. Yes? This particular budget? So this one here I don't have numbers for yet. So the, 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 so the space, so going all the way back to the beginning, so all the way back to the original rip down the walls kind of thing, we did that for, at the time, in 1998 dollars um, for less than $100,000. Uh, $100, okay, and that's pretty radical when you think about moving an air conditioner, putting in the power, doing the data, redoing the floors, and ripping out a wall. Now, 
If we just did half of that, I mean, if we just did the, the turnstile itself of that budget, by the way, the turnstile itself of that was $30,000 of that budget. Okay? So that's, that's a lot of expense for pizza. But the political cost was far higher. In the Karar space, which is downstairs, which is shut down now because it's in the process of being reprogrammed actually this summer into a research computing space for faculty and graduate students um, and undergraduates as well. So that's, that's the transition that's going to be going on. That space there, which was ne we'll preface with never supposed to be built. So we designed Utopia and we got Utopia in an era when you can get Utopia, which we can't get anymore. That came in at two point the budget was $2.3 million for 5,500 square feet. We came in $200,000 under budget. And the only, <laughs> the only sacrifice we made is we changed one counter t material type from granite to corian because it was cheaper. <laughs> I look back on it now and, you know, we would never build anything like that again. I mean, there's no way we can afford to build anything like that again. But that was never the point. Never, it was never the point to build Rolls Royce with, with glass tile and oak. The point was is to think about the seven different computing environments and how you think about that interaction and scale that down. A lot of what you see in that space is now reflected in furniture arrangements up there and places in which we're working and carrying that out in Regenstein Library and this library. And so we're doing that at much lower cost in other locations in the, in the you know, cost of furniture and getting networking to a location um, cost as opposed to building something out because we've shifted from I need to create a space that a lot of this stuff happens to how can we overlay this onto an existing program that may be already evolving how they're thinking about a space and then partnering and coming together as opposed to, again, doing the one-off specialized facility. Way in the back. We've been uh, experimenting with collaboration commons and collaboration centers, and what we're noticing are that users are getting very frustrated with the mice, the keyboard, or, and we're looking at some touch screen. I was just curious. If other possibilities like for groups to touch and adjust and move things around yep. the Yeah, actually, I mean, it's, the interesting thing is that that pod design first was sort of the first push of that, where we take, created that pod classroom. We have six of those now. Uh, trying to understand sort of the physical ex characteristics of what a space might be like and then how do we start laying new next generation technology <coughs> on it. From a multi-touch sort of screen thing, absolutely. We'd actually, there's a design which we, for economic reasons, will not be completed. Um, but there's a design actually for a classroom uh, that has sort of general computing kind of traditional classroom needs, but actually sho shoved to the wall. And in the center of the space is really taking a look at um, using drafting tables and plasma displays which, with touch screen interfaces associated with them built on the drafting tables so you can interact with information in new ways. Um, one of the areas that I've been looking at and just waiting basically for Microsoft to suddenly realize that selling cell phones with Microsoft Surface is a bad idea, but I, seeing how one could get that kind of technology into a library. I mean, and, and what inspired me for about that, I've been thinking quite a bit about it, is on the back of all of our books, there's a barcode. Those Microsoft Surface tables have barcode readers built in them. What's to say and what's preventing us from saying I can spread out my materials on there and using faceted browsing systems that we have now in place on campus that I could begin to build relationships between the materials I put on that surface and begin to assist somebody with their particular work and project that on a display. There's nothing preventing us really from doing that now other than access to the technology. So we're beginning to think a lot more about that in the new arts center and in, in the research and development areas in our scholarly technology and research computing group. Um, also looking then at I mean, there's a reason why this is 16 by 9, and it's actually that, that class that's being taught, and it's not to show really big movies, but it turns out they're using Axis Grid in this room and teaching the class that's in here also to whales. That's at simulcasting it to whales. And so they have all the students and the faculty on this screen at the same time, and you need to have that real estate. So we're beginning to look at that and saying, what, where, not to think about the technology, but how can we adapt the environment so we need to bring in the technology, and then if it becomes adopted, then how do we enhance the space in order to make that permanent, which is what's going to happen next year. We've determined that this is something that we want to continue with. How do we bring that up and, and move that forward? So we have a lot of R&D going on in that sense. I've got a comment and two questions. Sure. First, I want to commend the organizers for the order of these presentations, hearing both Shirley and then you talk about how what should drive these designs is the work practices that you want to support the existing work practices and those you want to encourage, mm -hmm. you know, that that should be the driver in thinking about the design and, and having the two perspectives on that has been, it's, it's 
Yeah, it's been helpful in my thinking. Um, my one question is, and you can decide which you sure. can ignore one or you can choose one. Um, my one question is now that, you know, given the financial environment we're in, how are you rescaling your approach to thinking about these sorts of design projects to adapt to that environment and, and what advice do you have there? And then the second one is, you know, you've talked about the user versus patron yep. and, you know, sort of working with libraries, mm -hmm. you know, as an IT organization. And, you know, based on the experience you have, which is now mm -hmm. lengthy, you know, what, what were the, you know, the frustrations, what are the benefits, what are some tips that I as a librarian can take in working most effectively with um, IT Folks like people? me? <laughs> right. So let me, let me look at the, the let me look at the, the first question being, uh, focus on given the economic climate, you know, what are the challenges we're facing, and you know, et cetera. And and I, and to me, actually, what has happened based on that is created more opportunities, because the only way you're really going to connect with the the, the faculty, the students, and the academic mission of the institution is enter into more dialogues with that. The days of us being able to go and build something off in a corner somewhere and saying we're serving the campus are gone because the money isn't there anymore to be able to do that. And so what we have to do is work more with organizations and saying, what is it that you want to do? Why We can complement that activity. We can bring something else to the table. We can bring something else to the equation. Let's have a conversation. Who else is engaged in this conversation and bring it together? And then everybody brings together a little bag of money that they set aside for this particular project. And you put it on the table and one go, wow, well, if you add all the three of those things together, it's actually a pretty reasonable bag of money. And if we talk to our planning committee about this or the provost office or whoever to get the approval of this saying, look, we're all willing to chip in our time and effort and resource around this to explore something else, then, but this is the reason why. It's not because we can't afford to do it ourselves, so we're now being forced together with that IT group over there. But it's more of a, you know, we really believe in what we need to be doing on campus and how can we advance our academic mission. You know, it's understanding, you know, one size doesn't fit all, so it's understanding, through the dialogue, you begin to understand your academic culture. And through, by doing that, what what's works for your institution isn't going to work necessarily at Chicago, and it's not going to work at Toronto, and it's not going to work somewhere else. You have to understand your particular students. Our students like moving furniture around. This is apparently a 100-year history of this place. And if there's anything that, that I've discovered in this building in the last several months while well, we ran into a, a, a data problem in the building, uh, the furniture in this room went everywhere. And you'd go around and suddenly there was a table over there and people were reconfiguring the space. So what did we do? We learned from that. We looked at that and said, you know, where do people like working and other things and observed that and brought that back. But you only get that by working together. So I think the opportunities are much greater now than before if you're willing to have the dialogue. Now, inter interacting with people like me. Um, I'll get in trouble for this because it's being recorded. <laughs> we're not the friendliest lot. <laughs> and I'm on a mission to change that. Um, the thing is, is that it's, we are, we are still very much, I think all of our cultures very much view, um, you know, we, we, know, we know our patrons, we know our users, we know what they want to do. And therefore, we know best. And so we sit down and we come to a table, I know my thing, you know your thing, and we argue. And half of that problem is not having a common language. If there's anything that I learned working on the project that developed the space downstairs and built this wonderful relationship we have with, with the libraries here at Chicago, is that you need to have a common language. We're not going to get all of the things back and forth, but it, it takes time to understand one another because, you know, user and patron are not the same thing, but if you talk about it and figure it out, you realize, well, yeah, there's aspects of well, how we think about users that fit into that patron definition. Oh, yeah, there's aspects about... You know, people just coming in and just want to get something done and we're not really providing a service, they're just uh, occupying space. We had a bit of, of a discussion about that last night about certain people and showing up in public, public library spaces and just doing other things that you wish they wouldn't do. <laughs> That's the user thing, right? Um, but it's a lot of that dialogue and back and forth and it takes time. But sometimes it's about finding the right context for that discussion. And as long as one thinks about this as what do you want to do to advance a larger mission or goal, you'll, you'll move forward. It's the, the scariest part is the force fit, you know, where you have the head of the IT organization and the head of the library say, thou shalt collaborate. Okay. Hi. Hi. 
great, we met, we had coffee, bye. You know, that, that's collaboration in one sense. But I think it's when you come together, and, and to me the exciting part is walking through and working with the different library folks. We start having a conversation of saying, hey, we've got a digital project that's being started. Oh, really? What's it, what's it about? Well, yeah, they're collecting a lot of the stuff and other things from the faculty member. Oh, that sounds a lot like a collection. Yeah, it does. Let's go talk to the folks in the Digital Library Development Center. Maybe we can partner and develop this kind of thing that will then fit into this classroom in the context of transforming medical education. But part of that is coming to the understanding in that basic language and finding the right project that doesn't put everybody on the defensive, but essentially says, okay, what do we need to advance something in a neutral way? When Shirley said, you know, academically neutral in terms of the library, that neutral space, it's very true is where can you find the neutral project that everybody wins when you're done with it. And it's, you may have to give up something, but that's, that's the opportunity that's there. I think with that, I've run over time. Yeah. And she hates me now. No, I don't. <laughs> we all love Chad. Thank you.